Hey guys, it's Josh with Update Channel, and every week I sit down and try to think of a topic or try to compile some shop videos to give you something entertaining, generally pertaining to diesel engines. I'm doing a lot of research, there's a lot of negativity out there about diesel engines, mostly their emissions, their sustainability, and a lot of problems. But the diesel engine, folks, was invented to actually reduce pollution and increase efficiency for society in general. And in this video, we're not actually talking about the diesel engine itself. We're talking about diesel, the man, the name behind the engine itself. And when I started doing research to see, did he even have an interesting life to see, would it be a good video? I was blown away by how interesting his life was. His early years, the development of the engine itself and the business behind that, and kind of what I was not in store for at all, the end of his life, or I should say his disappearance in 1913, which was probably one of the biggest news stories between the sinking of the Titanic and the start of World War I. So if any of those topics you may find interesting, stick around and listen to what I got to say about Rudolf Diesel, the man. So with any historical account, you probably want to list where you got this information from before you go talking about it. And most of the information I got was from a book, a very good book actually, called The Mysterious Case of Rudolf Diesel. And this is not a very old book, but it really goes through his early life, the time leading up to his life, his entire life, his impact after, but also it talks a lot about the history, the time period he's living, and a lot leading up to World War I. And a lot of the end of the book is dedicated to the end of his life and kind of the mystery behind that. If you do want to get a copy of it, I listened to the audiobook version while working on diesel engines, or you can get a hardcover or paperback version. I'll put the Amazon link there, but I highly recommend it if you're at all interested in diesel engines or anything history related. Very good. So enough talking about how I learned about it. Let's learn about the man himself, Rudolf Diesel. So you have to put yourself in the mindset of the time to try to understand this story. And the time he was born was 1858. Now in the U.S., that would have been pre-Civil War. The country wasn't even 100 years old yet, but he's not an American, folks. He's in Europe. And Europe in 1858, very tricky circumstances. He was actually born, even though he is from German descent, his parents are German, he was born in France, Paris, France. So you could say he's a Frenchman by birth, but his parents are German. But you can't even really say they're German because Germany wasn't even a country then. There was no country of Germany. That didn't even exist till 1871. And that time period will also tie in with this story. So he was a French-born German living in Paris, France to his two parents and his siblings. And his father owned a small shop. And from all accounts, his parents, well, I should say his father specifically, was a hard man. He once, Rudolf, disassembled a cuckoo clock in his youth to see how it worked because he was somewhat of an intellectual and loved how to know things worked. Well, his father didn't appreciate that too much and apparently he chained him to a sofa for an entire day and left him at home. So he didn't have probably the simplest and easiest upbringings. Also, his parents were quite poor. He did not come from a moneyed background. So being, we'll just say Germany, you know, they were Prussian, or I guess you could say Bavarian descent living in France, around 1870, if you know your history, there was a war coming called the Franco-Prussian War. This is where Prussia, aka Germany, invades France and defeats France. And at this time in Paris, basically, most people of German descent left the country. where they go? What depends? The Diesels left and went to England. So now we have young Rudolf, around 12 years old, is now living in England, fleeing from France from an invading army that is from his genetic lineage. So very interesting beginnings. Now, I'm not going to dwell too much on his early life because obviously you want to get to the meat, the diesel engine part. Well, we didn't live too long in England, but he ended up being shipped to Germany to an engineering school because in England they discovered, or I guess they'd probably already known, but this young child was very intelligent 
and engineering seemed to be where he belonged. So he shipped off to Germany to learn about engineering. His parents ended up moving back to Paris, France, and basically from that point on, Diesel's life is engineering for the rest of his life. Now folks, it's important to realize that there weren't engines really at this point other than steam engines. It's not like there were gasoline engines and jet engines and he just figured out this diesel engine. There were very early gasoline style engines called the auto engine, but really they, there weren't cars. People rode horses, some people rode bicycles. Very different time, you have to remember that. So one thing that he learned early on in engineering school, and I'm sure he learned a lot more than me, he was one of the top students ever to attend the school, was the compression of air can generate heat energy. Interesting, well not generate it, you can't create or destroy energy, but basically it'll concentrate it through friction. And this, he thought, that's interesting. I wonder if this could be applied later in life. In fact, I just bought something that we're gonna do a little experiment to show this very experiment that he saw over 100 years ago, that just by compressing air, you can actually generate heat. So what this is called, folks, is a fire piston. At least that's what I found it on Amazon, and it was about $15. There's glass versions where you can see what's going on, but they don't seem to hold up very long. So what it is, it's basically a brass cap, and aluminum housing, and a brass piston. And the piston has an O-ring on it to simulate the piston ring. And what I've filled it with here is, they call it char paper. It's basically charcoal embedded into uh, paper, cloth paper. And basically, it's not hot already, it's room temperature. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this cylinder in here and then compress it very quickly just by pushing down on it. And it will actually start an ignition process of the carbon paper. So we're gonna do this experiment. It's just carbon paper in there, folks. It's room temperature. I'm just gonna push down and watch. Look at that. There is a coal. Isn't that interesting? So Rudolph saw a small experiment like this and this is what stuck with him. By merely compressing the air, it will concentrate and generate heat. And this can be used for, obviously, very useful purposes. Now after school, after he was done with school and college, he got out and he started working actually not in any sort of engine building capacity, but he started working for a man named Lind and they did refrigeration. Now refrigeration, you might think, has nothing to do with engines, but refrigeration, if you're familiar with it, and engines, there's a lot to deal with pressures and heat and temperatures, right? So basically, you can apply a lot of the same principles one way or the other if you're in refrigeration to engine building. And Diesel worked for Lind in Paris most of the time, where he was also married and ended up having three children. This is where he started coming up with the idea for an engine. His initial engines, which we're talking about now, finally the engines themselves, were a lot different than you might be thinking of. And his initial intentions were to make an engine that a shop owner like his father could have used to power a small shop so that they can have something like a mill or textile on a small scale to help family businesses. Now, of course, that isn't necessarily what the engines ended up being for, but those were his initial ideas. And first he was actually experimenting with ammonia engines. You'd be saying, what, that ammonia? But in refrigeration, that's probably a lot more common than it is nowadays when you think about an engine, either gasoline or jet engine or diesel engine. But his first experiments with those, not really that successful. So he started toying with the compression ignition engines. In fact, he even tried using an external ignition source for his compression ignition engines before realizing that you don't really need that. Now, his first engines built in the early 1890s, the first one on the first successful combustion actually exploded and it almost killed him. Now, you might be saying, what? That would probably scare a lot of people off from ever trying to experiment with them again, but not Rudolph Diesel. He stuck with it. And on his third engine attempt, he got a running model. And this was a obviously very simple engine. And you have to remember too, folks, this is not something you could go get parts for. Modern machine work, basically parts, fuel systems, all those didn't exist. There was no internet. 
you basically had to make everything yourself. We're talking about leather seals, rope seals, um, very poorly cast metals. This, there's a good reason why the first engine exploded. You are, he was just experimenting. Now, he wasn't the type to just mess with stuff and see what happened. He was a purpose-driven person where he would design something and test how it worked. So once he got his first engine model in a working format and he could patent it, then he could make some money from it. Now, from the books telling, I never knew the man, but money never seemed to be the main motivating factor for Rudolph. His main thing was trying to help society in general. Now, of course, inventing a earth-changing engine like a diesel engine, you're going to make some money on that. And he did patent it, and he was able to become quite wealthy off of it. But he never actually just made the engines themselves. How he actually made money off it, quite interesting. And he was trying to better society because, if you remember, the steam engine was really the main means of shipping any sort of industrial processes was steam powered and steam power is generally powered by coal the steam is just the secondary effect which steam is just of course hot water coal was mostly what was being burned although you could burn wood but most people were burning coal and they're super inefficient steam engines are something like those type of steam engines we're talking about an open boiler type steam engine two to five percent thermally efficient and Rudolf Diesel's initial calculations told him his engine could be 73% efficient. Now, it was not 73% efficient. Most diesel engines are high 20s to maybe 50% fuel efficient. But if you compare that to steam engines at the time, that's a 10 to 1 ratio of efficiency increase. So his goal was to completely change the industrial engine design out there by basically getting rid of the steam engine. And with an internal combustion engine, you can do that. You don't need steam at all if the fuel you're burning will produce enough force to turn a crankshaft, which whether it's gasoline or diesel, that's what it does. So this ties into how he made his money and the patents. You might be saying, well, that's kind of a boring subject, Josh. Well, it's really not because how, the, how he made his money in the patent system actually touched a lot of different interesting people at this time. If you've ever heard of Anheuser-Busch, you probably have one, basically the largest beer manufacturer in the world. Well, Adolphus Busch, Adolphus Busch, Anheuser-Busch was the first one to get the patent in the United States or buy the rights for the patent in the United States. You'd be saying, what? Why would a beer manufacturer want the patent? Well, he was actually one of the wealthiest men in the United States and beer production is a large industry so and he ended up becoming lifelong friends with mr diesel adolphus bush so that was a pretty interesting story that touches throughout this book from the time they met up till his i'll just say disappearance in 1913. another name that you may have heard nobel you might be saying nobel peace prize the name yes apparently there were three nobel brothers not just one and nobel the peace prize guy actually invented dynamite but he's not related or he is related he's a brother too but he's not tied in with the other nobels see in russia the nobel brothers bought the patenting and uh, the patenting rights i should say and they were mostly involved in oil production at the time now them in russia producing oil they were competing with people in the united states like johnny rockefeller and they produced some of the up to the time of the 1918 uh, communist takeover of Russia, some of the most successful diesel engines ever produced, and mostly that was dealing with shipping. Very interesting story how just the diesel engine idea and patenting and sale of the patents ties in with so many different other things. Now, the way the patents were licensed was by country. So this was supposed to be the technology that each manufacturer in each separate country that the patent was supposed to share information but of course at the time this was a time of much higher nationalism than now they wouldn't share ideas necessarily now a lot of the countries also had growing animosities as you started getting into the early 1900s particularly leading up to world war one now diesel like i said was a man from a very 
unstable background. Born in France, from German parents, lived in England. He had a lot of friends in England also. Charles Parsons, the inventor of the steam turbine, for example, was a very close friend with him. He had friends in the United States, France, Germany, Russia, all over the place. Leading up to World War I, though, of course, countries didn't want to be sharing technology, particularly ones that knew they may be in conflict soon. And two of the biggest ones were, of course, Great Britain and Germany. Now, Great Britain and Germany, before the early 1900s, has actually had very good relationships under Bismarck, who was much better at building friendships, we'll say. But after Bismarck was let go and Kaiser Wilhelm, of Germany was basically antagonizing England, they became higher and higher in animosity. And this was leading up to 1913, which is when Diesel's disappearance happened, unfortunately. Now, his disappearance is very interesting, and in the book, much of the end of the book has to deal with it. And there's basically three rules of thoughts of what happened when Diesel, will just say, disappeared. He was on a ship, the SS Dresden, flying under the British flag, 1913, which is the year before, of course, World War I. He was on his way to England, and he was going to be with Mr. Parsons in England and actually meeting with the Royal Navy to discuss diesel engines. Now, of course, Germany probably didn't want him, their, one of their best inventors in their country, to be discussing diesel engines with a potential enemy. So... The first thought is that he was killed. Is this possible? Of course it's possible. No one saw what happened, at least no one's ever said what happened. So is it possible that maybe German agents or maybe British agents, who knows, killed Rudolf Diesel? We may never know. Second is suicide. Now, is it possible that he, maybe he was a manic depressant, never said it. There's a lot of things leading up to his death in 1913, or disappearance, if you want to call it that. He, before he went on this trip, actually gave his wife a note not to open till after he was on the ship. He showed his oldest son through their mansion and gave him keys to everything and showed him where everything was. There's a lot of weird stuff that led up to his disappearance in 1913, right before he went disappearing. Also, his journal on the date of his disappearance, the only entry was a cross. Kind of weird. Now, the seas were calm that evening that he went disappearing, so an accident is unlikely, but who knows. And the book actually puts forth the idea that he didn't, he wasn't murdered or didn't kill himself. It was actually a very early British, uh, we'll just call it secret ops mission to get him off of that ship, and then get him to research submarine engines, mostly diesel engines, for the British Navy, and moved him to Canada. The book actually makes a very good case for this. Now, of course, folks, I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't think anyone watching this video was there to know what actually happened to him. I generally like to think that the simplest explanation, which I think would probably be suicide, unfortunately, explains it, but the book makes a very good case that he may have actually ended up working secretly through World War I for the British government because they made a lot of advances and they had never really made much advances before World War I in diesel engines. Very interesting life. I'm not a historian, folks. I'm just someone that has worked on diesel engines basically my entire adult life. Thought it'd be a very interesting story to discuss his life. And the last thing I'm going to say was the SS Dresden, which was the ship that he went missing on, was a steamship. And it was sunk during World War I by a German submarine with a diesel engine.